Chapter 1 Who is Jesus? Three little boys were arguing about whose father got home faster from work each day. The first boy boasted that his father was a former Olympian, middle-distance runner, and ran in record times. He left work at 4 p.m. every afternoon, and although his home was three miles away, he would grab his briefcase and run all the way, reaching home by 4.15. The second boy was not to be outdone. His father, he said, had competed in professional auto racing, and once he put his foot to the pedal, nothing could get in his way. He also worked three miles away, and also left work at four, but reached home by 4.05. The third one was just chuckling at all these boastful claims. He knew he had them both beaten. His father, he said, actually worked five miles away from home. He left work at four every afternoon and got home half an hour before he left work at 3.30. He, he worked for the government. Uh, with my apologies to all those in civil service, the point I want to make is that it is human nature to lay claim to something that is exceptional or superior to everyone else, whether it is one's culture, a great landmark building, or a skilled leader. Our skyscrapers are higher than your skyscrapers. My culture is better than your culture. My culture is older than your culture. My dad is stronger or smarter or faster than your dad. So goes the game of one-upmanship. To those who feel that Christianity has failed them, I ask, have you sometimes wonder whether that's all there is to religion too? One culture claiming that its values are better than another's or that one's faith is superior to someone else's faith? Are all religions basically false? Are all religions basically true? Are all religions merely ethnocentric prejudices camouflaged by spiritual talk? After years of belief as a Christian, I have to reluctantly and sadly admit that sometimes this does seem to be the case. Some religions do lay claim to a superior heritage by virtue of a superior birthright. Islam, for example, touts the language of the Quran as the supreme linguistic expression so that reading it in any other language other than Arabic deprives the reader of experiencing the miracle. The prophet of Islam is specifically the prophet of Arabia, and yet he's supposed to be supreme over the world of revelation. If religion can be reduced to bragging rights, it is a very deadly game, isn't it? People give their hard-earned money and their valuable time to pin all their hopes for the eternal and owe so much more on that belief. What one deems to be of ultimate value exacts a cost in proportion. Indeed, a close scrutiny of some religions will show that many religious claims are indeed all about the, quote, son bragging about the father, unquote, resulting in questions about the father himself. Something else about religion that is equally discomforting to many is its claim to exclusivity. But this ought not to surprise us, because truth, by definition, must exclude that which contradicts it. When someone claims that their religion is superior to other faiths but cannot support the claim, we should ask what this claim of supremacy looks like when it is applied to matters of life and destiny. And it is even more important to ask these questions before walking away from a belief once held as the dearest of commitments. At a recent forum in India, I was asked why someone with an apparently passionate commitment to his or her belief in Jesus Christ would suddenly, quote, come out of the closet, end of quote, declaring this belief untenable. For some, it may very well be that the Christianity that has resulted in disappointment may have been nothing more than a boast that, quote, my father is better than your father, end of quote, rather than having been a true faith that has been lost after examining the claims of Christianity with an honest heart and mind and finding it wanting. Before we can talk about some of the existential problems some people believe they have experienced with Christianity, we must begin this discussion by taking a close look at the claims of Jesus and their implications. Who is Jesus? And what does he teach? And Christianity by extension. For this is the only way to determine that it is really Christianity that has failed and not something or someone else. Matthew tells us, 
that Jesus placed a little child among the leaders he was developing, his disciples, and declared, quote, The kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these, end of quote, Matthew 19, verse 14. Meaning, without the simple faith of a child, we cannot see heaven. At the same time, he won the commitment of the scrutinizing mind of Saul of Tarsus, who knew and had done all that the law required for salvation. An honest examination of Jesus' pronouncements readily demonstrates that they uniquely transcend all cultural distinctives and can be powerfully confirmed by human need, longing, and observation across cultures and language groups. A great many books are being written about this Jesus today, even by those who disavow his historic assertions. After all, in the fallout of postmodernism, one can make anyone say anything about anything bereft of text or the context. Physician and author Deepak Chopra has cleverly written two books on Jesus. One he admits is a complete work of fiction, though you can be sure he has a real motive in doing so, and the other in which he says that Jesus finally gained enlightenment in his pursuit of the ultimate. Though he claims to greatly admire Jesus, such twisted writing betrays the truth taught by Jesus and distorts history. Once we understand Jesus in his own words and measure his claims and promises against our deepest needs, we'll be surprised at just how personal and magnificent he really is. The way, the truth, and the life, John 14, verse 6, rather than being merely the focus of deviously rendered fictitious storylines. C.S. Lewis's conversion story, Surprised by Joy, describes this precisely. Lewis says that his greatest realization, after he had finally recognized who Jesus is and what he offers to every human heart, was that he had not come to a place or accepted a belief, he had come to a person, and that person is the very person of God. The spiritual talk of today is all about ideas and feelings. Jesus' message, on the other hand, is about the person and presence of God. The spiritual talk of today minimizes fact and maximizes the mystical. Jesus always connected experience to fact. The spiritual talk of today engages in seductive doublespeak, Jesus presented the truth as absolute, even when it was uncomfortable to hear, never making mysticism the ultimate goal, but putting it in the context of what was real. The spiritual talk of today employs cliches that endanger the spirit by making truth secondary to what feels good. Jesus taught that feeling his presence is only possible because of the fact of his existence. The spiritual talk of today claims to be generously accepting of all faiths, while in reality, with a prejudice that disregards reason and misplaces faith. It undermines the only faith that truly teaches tolerance. The message of Jesus goes beyond mere religion or belief and dramatically alters our way of thinking and being. He challenges all of humanity to taste and see that He is good and to take to heart the truth that his word abides forever. Some time ago, I attended a football game in my home city of Atlanta. Through the courtesy of one of the players, we were seated close to the team's bench. Years before, I had watched a game from the nosebleed section, and I remember thinking how small the players looked and how vast the playing field appeared. This time, however, I was so close to the players that I could almost hear them breathing, and I was quite surprised by how big they were and by how small the field really was. When we are close enough to the Jesus of history that we can look at history from his perspective, we actually see how mighty and strong he is and how navigable life is with him as the captain. Giving a face to Jesus. Growing up in India, I heard his name many times. In the Hindi language, his name is Isa Masih, which is transliterated from Jesus, the Messiah. Christians are called Isais, meaning Jesus ones or Jesus followers. Christmas is Baladin, the big day. Yes, I heard the name of Jesus, 
but apart from associating him with going to church and with the festivities of Easter and Christmas, his name meant nothing to me. His picture hung in our home at eye level in my parents' bedroom, which was the larger of the two small bedrooms in our home in New Delhi, India. My earliest memory of that picture is that my mother never opened her eyes in the morning until she had first reached for her glasses and positioned them on her face. Only then would she turn toward the picture and open her eyes so that the face of Jesus was the first thing she saw every morning. It was a ritual for her, and in a culture where superstition abounds, these fears and habits are subtly passed on from generation to generation. So when I was in a crisis, I would go into her room, lean on the little chest of drawers, look at the picture, and make my petition. If I was sure that nobody would see me, I would even kneel in front of it and mutter a quick plea for help, especially at examination time. I remember it well, a faded, green-hued version of the most famous of all paintings, one of Solomon's, the head of Christ. Back then, however, it was just a picture to me, a talisman. Artists have drawn pictures, painted canvases, and sculpted images of Jesus as they see him. It's odd, isn't it, that the most revered personality in history, whose birth is the point of reference for our calendar, and whose life is described as the greatest story ever told, has left us no picture of himself. Just as the most defining moment of our lives, our own births cannot be recalled, the most supreme name in all of history, honored by millions, is ultimately faceless to us. I also recall as a young teen seeing an American movie magazine that ended up in our home through some American friends. I remember seeing a picture of an actor seated on a chair, his face in his hands, and the bold caption above the picture reading, quote, Dare I, a sinner, play Christ? End of quote. For years, no movie production ever showed Jesus' face, just his back or his body from his shoulders down. Modern authorities in the field of communication would consider this a huge lapse. After all, isn't a picture worth a thousand words? God indicated that the contrary is true. It is not seeing that is all important. It is the act of recognizing that brings together much more than mere sight. One of the fascinating stories in the book of Exodus pictures Moses on the verge of leading the people of Israel from bondage in Egypt into the promised land. In Exodus chapter 33, verses 12 to 23, it has been a long and arduous journey. The Israelites have lost many lives and faced severe deprivations. Moses goes off alone to pray and pleads with God, Show me your glory. What an amazing request, considering that Moses has already experienced a series of miracles that had brought them from slavery to that point. No one could have doubted that a supernatural hand had guided them from escaping the Egyptians at the Red Sea to the revelation of the Ten Commandments to the provision of their food and clothing along the journey. This horde of humanity never made it without divine intervention. Yet Moses still asked to see God's face, even being so bold before God as to insist that he would not cross over the Jordan River without being assured of God's presence. God gave an even more amazing response to Moses' request. You cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. And so he told Moses, There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Exodus chapter 33, verses 20 to 22. Thus Moses would see, quote, the back of God, but not, quote, his face. It might have been like walking into a room and knowing someone is there, perhaps smelling their cologne or perfume or hearing them breathing, even hearing a voice, but not being able to see the person. Maybe something like Dorothy's first meeting with the Wizard of Oz. Perhaps if we are able to understand why God has kept his face from us, we'll have a clue to why we must learn to recognize him and sense his presence through his words and deeds rather than through his physical features. I venture two bold reasons. First, if we could see God's face, 
his defining physical features would necessarily be very different depending on what part of the world we're in. In the East, it would become all about the image itself rather than the person, and the image would become the focus of adulation. The clothes he wore, his hairstyle, anything even remotely connected to his facial appearance would become a fetish and the object of worship to which the superstitious or spiritually minded would cling. The idolatry of the means as an end would be inescapable. During a visit to India's southern state of Kerala, I was driven to a city with the tongue-twisting name of Kodangalur. Kodangalur is famous for one thing. It was here according to tradition and even some historical references that the Apostle Thomas is said to have arrived in India in AD 53. Famed writers of early Christian history, such as the Venerable Bede or Gregory of Nazianzus, among others, have made reference to Thomas's trip to India. The oldest denominational Christian church in India bears the name of Thomas, the Martoma Church. I walked around the site of Thomas's disembarkation and let my imagination wander until a caretaker offered to show me one of the relics of the apostle that was near the altar encased in a glass vault behind a heavily locked door. As she unlocked the door to the vault and I moved toward the relic, the voluminous sound of a hymn broke out, a security measure that alerted the keepers of the shrine that somebody was close to the relic. The guide bowed her head for a moment and touched the glass with her hand. She then touched her heart and kissed her hand in reverence. Inside the vault, on the other side of a magnifying glass, was a small bone from the right arm of the apostle. After his martyrdom in India, Thomas's body was sent to Rome but in more recent times, the Pope authorized a piece of bone from Thomas's remains to be sent to the historic shrine. As I stared at that little piece of bone, it was about two inches long, I couldn't help but wonder not only about its authenticity, but about Thomas himself. Needless to say, stories of this bone's magical powers abound. The Eastern mind invents the fantastic and reveres fetishes and relics as the means to its belief. Over the years, millions have made their pilgrimage to that spot, touched the vault, and kissed the glass barrier that separates them from that small piece of bone. In the West, a slightly different scenario might unfold if we knew exactly what Jesus looked like. Yes, there would be those who, like their counterparts in the East, would truly reverence the object rather than the Savior. But I also believe that the financial rewards of its commercialization would be enormous. Can you imagine what would have happened if James, the half-brother of Jesus, had opened up a memorabilia shop to sell pictures of Jesus? Rather than being reduced to his own image, in the West, God would be reduced to our image. Expositions of his face would abound, each expert claiming different insight. There would be, in all probability, multiple attempts to isolate and replicate DNA that might still cling to any artifact. Could you imagine a Jesus look-alike contest? One can only pity the winner at Christmas. Before long, lobbyists would demand a transgendered rendering of the Christ. Why was he male and not female or neither? And God forbid, if he were a white male. Our demand for infinite knowledge is insatiable. And to think there is a being who is beyond our capability of dissecting and studying scientifically is more than some of us can handle. Think about it. Is there any other language in the world like English in which so many versions of the Bible are available and each new translator claiming a unique perspective on the truth? Each one adds a little more information to the picture until what becomes important to us is how we view God rather than how he views us. Too many have so humanized God and deified man that we can scarcely tell the difference anymore. Books of this nature become bestsellers because they assure us that God is just one of us. But the ramifications of this familiarity are dangerous and destructive. We have tried to reshape God to become relevant to us rather than finding out how we must become relevant to Him. We in the West simply cannot live with the possibility that God has purposely left Himself clothed in mystery until we are able to recognize who He truly is. We have tried to conform him to our image rather than the other way around 
and objects of spiritual significance exact a disfigurement of stupendous proportions. There may be a second reason that God has kept his face from us. Billy Graham, the noted evangelist, likes to tell of a time he was staying at a hotel in a Pennsylvania town. As the elevator door shut on him and a couple of his colleagues, another passenger in the elevator said, quote, I hear Billy Graham is staying in this hotel, end of quote. One of Dr. Graham's colleagues pointed to Dr. Graham and said, that's him. There was a moment of uncomfortable silence while the man looked Dr. Graham up and down, and then he said, what an anticlimax. <laughs> Sometimes it is better to keep the mystery intact, though knowing what Jesus looks like would fulfill a longing within us. I am convinced it is a longing that can only be met when our minds and hearts have been lifted to a far higher level in which we could contain that transcending, awe-inspiring reality. Instead, God has disclosed himself in descriptive terms that gives us enough information to be able to know who he is, and he has hidden enough of himself for us to learn the balance between faith and reason. No earthly relationship with an infinite transcendent God can exist without maintaining these two aspects. In the Hindu faith, there is a defining story of a young man coming to a sage to inquire what life is all about. The sage asks the youth to go to a nearby tree and pick the fruit. When he has done so, the sage directs him to cut open the fruit. Then he instructs him to remove one of the seeds and break open the seed. Finally, the wise man asks, What do you see inside the seed? Nothing, is the reply. Well, young man, returns the sage, just as that tree emerged from nothing, so from nothing is this thing we call life. The more you know about it, the more you will find that life and its source are reduced to nothing. Now, to be fair, the sage could have meant that nothing is not really nothing, that the source of all existence is an intangible reality, some life-giving force. But it is here that the Christian faith makes a serious departure from Hindu teaching. Far from teaching that all existence comes from nothing, the Gospel of John begins this way. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 14. This series of assertions in John 1.1 1, 1, harks back to the beginning of the book of Genesis, where we read, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Bereshith bara Elohim. In the beginning, God. On these three Hebrew words, all else hangs. The created order does not declare nothing as its ultimate cause, nor does it acknowledge merely a force behind the cause. There is a person behind the cause. A person is more than the physical Personhood involves essence of thought, will, and feeling, a thinking, willing, and feeling entity in relationship. God created a quantity we call the universe. He created an entity we call humanity. The quantity or thing he created did not have a mind. The entity he created did have a mind. That is the heart of the human story. It is the mind that holds together the confluence of values and teaches us to value both the quantity and the entity in proper relationship. It is the mind that frames questions of moral significance and purpose. It is the mind that sees not just the face of the person, but the person behind the face. It is the mind that holds memories and processes, texts within contexts so much so that when the mind has become disconnected from those memories, we wonder who the person is anymore. Connecting the body and the mind. Which of us, given a chance, would not want to see this Jesus of history? The noted talk show host Larry King was once asked to identify the one person across all of history that he would have liked to interview. Jesus, he answered, to see him, to touch him, to recognize him. That would be the pursuit, wouldn't it? The Apostle Paul writes, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, 
no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9. And one day we shall know God as we are known by him. What do we know about ourselves? We know what we feel, what we long for, whom we love, hate, judge. In short, everything we know about ourselves we know through our senses. But still, our knowledge of ourselves is partial. God is the only one who knows us comprehensively. By denying him and his existence, we reject the one person who knows us completely with the result that we truly become strangers to ourselves and to others. C.S. Lewis rightly said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see by it, but because by it I see everything else. If we have become strangers to ourselves and to others, and in effect cannot recognize the truth about ourselves, why do our questions assume that we are able to reason comprehensively enough to be able to recognize and understand God? The implication in our disenchantment with Christianity is that God is not who we thought he was or who we thought he ought to be. He doesn't do things the way we think he should or thought he would. He has not lived up to our expectations. Our minds seek answers that will satisfy us and make us comfortable. Why asks the one with the gay lifestyle? Is my lifestyle not accepted as normal? Why asks the one who has committed adultery? Is the way back so fraught with moral condemnation? Why, when I have been wronged, do I expect everyone to accept my side of the issue? In short, we establish an ought from what is and consider those who do not agree with us to be wrong. Are we not supposing that it would be a better world if we were treated according to the terms we feel or think we merit? The Human Dilemma I believe two propositions summarize the basic struggle we have over our expectations of God and demonstrate at the same time that Jesus is the answer to that dilemma. The first is that the world is made for the body, the body is made for the soul, and the soul is made for God. The second proposition comes from Thomas Merton, quote, We cannot be at peace with others because we are not at peace with ourselves, and we cannot be at peace with ourselves because we are not at peace with God. The first statement that the world is made for the body, the body for the soul, and the soul for God is drawn from three realities, the world, the body, and the soul. Merton's proposition draws from three different realities, our fellow humans, ourselves, and God. Both of these propositions describe a transactional relationship, how an individual relates to the physical world and to others who comprise one's personal world. Isolation from these is not a possibility. Even if a man were to live alone on an island, he would talk to himself and relate to the physical world around him, as was beautifully portrayed by Tom Hanks in Castaway. Man is not a completely self-contained, unidirectional being. The questions that haunt us always come from two directions. One, how do we make sense of this physical world we find ourselves part of? And two, how do we make sense of the spiritual yearnings we have and the earthly relationships that make up our lives? Even as I write this, I realize there is no place to set my feet and feel completely secure in this world. The world seems to be in turmoil. I was scheduled to write in a secluded setting in Thailand, but just two days before I left the United States, the airports in Bangkok were shut down. Thousands stormed the new multi-billion dollar airport, in protest against their political leadership, and all international travel was shut down for days. Thailand is a Buddhist country, and Buddhism is supposed to reflect the heart of peace. Not at the moment. So I was diverted to New Delhi. But India was reeling from the violent terrorist acts of Muslim radicals, who took over two of the most beautiful hotels in Mumbai and slaughtered 200 innocent people in the process. They were followers of Allah, the compassionate. As my two experiences demonstrate, is it any wonder that the world looks at both politics and religion and mocks them for being bereft of answers? Both seem to use people as a means to accomplish their own ends. 
or the reverse happens. People use both politics and religion only to accomplish their own ends. For years, a common phrase heard in the West has been, Jesus is the answer. Tired of that glib statement, cynics respond with their own question, but what is the question? Asserting that we Westerners have come of age and no longer need religion, we are passionate in our declaration that all religions are equally false and therefore should all be consigned to the dustbins of history. But while we proclaim that all religions are equally false, it is interesting that Christianity is perceived by many today to be more false than the others and more deserving of rejection. The feather in the cap of this condemning judgment against Christianity is that many in the fold of skepticism claim to have once been believers in Jesus, but have come out of the closet, confessing that they simply no longer have any belief. God is but the vestige of an idea they once enjoyed, but have now cast aside with certainty. Jesus is nothing more than an ideal that inspired music, art, and architecture. As a person, he really does not matter. His historical existence is at best moot, like a snake shedding its skin and leaving it behind to mingle with the dust of the earth, God is no longer of any consequence. In fact, since God is actually a product of our primitive or immature imagination, we have discovered that in reality, it is He who needs us in order to exist. We don't need Him. This skepticism about God arises from what we perceive as unanswered questions about life. But in spite of our skepticism, our hearts still beat with those persistent, unanswered longings, and in desperation or cynicism, our minds continue to ponder the deep issues of our existence. The Question of All Questions I do not believe that we will ever be able to understand the depth of our own questions until we first understand ourselves, the questioners. We're like the young man in a Q&A session who, after some discussion, finally said, What then? Am I asking? Further, I do not believe that we will ever understand who we are until we understand who Jesus is for our encounter with him, this quote, faceless unquote figure, defines what it means to be human. So before we can even discuss Christianity and whether it has failed us, let us first consider who Jesus is. The 20th century Scottish preacher James Stewart makes a powerful statement when he talks of the mystery of Jesus' personality as the, quote, startling coalescence of contrarieties, end of quote, and here's what he says. He was the meekest and lowliest of all the sons of men, yet he spoke of coming on the clouds of heaven with the glory of God. He was so austere that evil spirits and demons cried out in terror at his coming, yet he was so genial and winsome and approachable that the children loved to play with him and little ones nestled in his arms. His presence at the innocent gaiety of a village wedding was like the presence of sunshine. No one was half so compassionate to sinners, yet no one ever spoke such red-hot scorching words about sin. A bruised reed he would not break. His whole life was love, yet on one occasion he demanded of the Pharisees how they ever expected to escape the damnation of hell. He was a dreamer of dreams and a seer of visions, Yet for sheer stark realism, he has all of our self-styled realists soundly beaten. He was a servant of all, washing the disciples' feet. Yet masterfully he strode into the temple, and the hucksters and money changers fell over one another from the mad rush and the fire they saw blazing in his eyes. He saved others, yet at the last himself he did not save. There is nothing in history like the union of contrasts that confronts us in the Gospels. The mystery of Jesus is the mystery of divine personality. End of quote. A contradiction, according to the Random House Webster's College Dictionary, is a statement or proposition that denies another statement or itself and is logically incongruous. A contrariety, however, holds two aspects of an issue in balance and in tension without violating the logical congruency of either. In the contrarieties within Jesus, we see how he represents the answer for all the tensions we feel within ourselves. For example, the Gospel of John refers to Jesus as being in the beginning 
and also as being with his father. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. How could he have always been and yet come into history to be in our midst? This contrariety of Jesus' eternal existence and historical existence has made it at once both difficult and most relevant. The prophet Isaiah tells us, To us a child is born, to us a son is given, Isaiah 9, 6. Please note that the son was not born. The child was born. The son was not born because the son always existed. The incarnation of the son as the child lying in the manger is the embodiment of the eternal one who came to reveal and connect this mind-body struggle of ours, this struggle to connect who we are as material beings with who we are as spiritual beings. Jesus the Son Jesus' sonship is qualified in four ways. When we come to terms with these qualifications, we are better able to understand why we think and why we struggle the way we do. Those four qualifications give us the relational terms that ought to engage our attention and enable us to recognize Him as the sole answer to all of our questions about meaning, purpose, pain, and destiny. Son of David The first description of Jesus as a man is clearly His ethnic lineage. In the 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel, we find the story of a blind man named Bartimaeus. Look at his name carefully. Bar Timaeus. Ironically, we really do not have a name for him. He is simply son of Timaeus, which is what his name means. His only identity in the story is through his father. In that time and culture, it was not uncommon for a son to be named in relation to the father, as in Simon Barjona. This method established bragging rights within a culture. In the present-day Middle East, after the birth of a son, a parent is often known as mother of so-and-so. So here we are introduced to the blind son of Timaeus, and Bartimaeus cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Mark 10, 47. Notice he not only addresses Jesus by his name, but he also recognizes his lineage, his Jewish ancestry and descent from King David, the greatest of Israel's kings. No monarch in Israel is more revered than David. If one were to go back in time to the great prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, Ezekiel, Amos, and Hosea, they all predicted that the Messiah would be a son of David. Quote, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. End of quote. Wrote the prophet Isaiah, chapter 9 and verse 7. There could have been no political vision higher than to restore the throne of the beloved and revered King David who triumphed over the challenges and threats of his day with courage and humility. Because of David, his people were respected in their time. There is something unique in this acclamation. Jesus was from the line of Jewish kings, but he did not come as the king of the Jews. When Pilate sentenced him to crucifixion, he ordered a sign to be nailed to the cross over Jesus' head that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Even though the priests protested the designation, Pilate had given Jesus and demanded to have it removed. John 19, verses 19 to 22. There is irony here. Pilate saw Jesus as a would-be Jewish king, sentenced to death under Roman law for treason. It's interesting that this Roman saw Jesus in a greater light than did the Jews themselves. That Pilate recognized Jesus as a king was a slap in the face to the Jewish authorities because they did not recognize him as a king. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey on Palm Sunday, the crowd did want to crown him as their king, but he roundly rejected their designs for him because he had not come to earth 
to lead one nation in its political pursuits. He was absolutely clear when he said to Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. John 18, verse 36. Yet Bartimaeus cried out to Jesus by his name and title, implicitly recognizing him as the heir to the throne of David. Jesus' designation as son of David suggests both his ethnicity and the political hopes of his people. Bartimaeus recognized who Jesus was. The Jews of Jesus' day, suffocating under the scourge of Roman rule, longed for ethnic supremacy and a political identity. But Jesus rejected these aspirations with the not-so-subtle reminder that they were secondary to the nation's spiritual malady. He reminded his listeners, as he would later tell Pilate, that his call was not to one particular nation, nor was his kingship one of political power. Rather, it was to rule in the hearts of men and women who understood his higher call for us to be citizens of heaven and sons and daughters of God. This was hard for some Jews in that day to accept, and it's hard for those of us today who desperately wish for political solutions to our national problems. But here again, there is a balance. It is not that political solutions are not important. Rather, it is that when it comes to moral issues, political solutions are at best superficial. In time, they will be whittled down, fade, and be replaced. Slavery can be made illegal but racial prejudice may still remain. The caste system may be outlawed in India, but intercaste marriage is still deemed to be a step down. Human beings will always find ways to divide and create hierarchies. Such is the plight of the human heart. Go back for a moment. The blind son of Timaeus called out to Jesus, the son of David, to heal him. Jesus looked at him and asked a rather obvious question. What do you want me to do for you? In Mark 10 and 51. Rabbi, I want to see, he responded. With that one simple declaration, he revealed every yearning of his heart. For Jesus says, your faith has healed you. In verse 52. The affirmation given to this blind man was the first acknowledgement of his own identity. It was his faith rather than someone else's faith, and it was his faith in Jesus that was responsible for his healing. This is the first clue to transcending ethnicity. One may call to Jesus out of his ethnic and cultural distinctive, but one's ultimate transformation comes in that personal dimension of trust apart from any cultural elitism. Teacher, I want to see. No matter what one's race or station in life, we come to him to see beyond the immediate and to be freed from the tyranny of the moment. A Contrast of Visions A few years ago, I visited Jerusalem while researching a book on Islam. I asked for and was granted a personal appointment with the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, in terms of political appointments within Islam, this position is considered the third highest. The first is the Grand Mufti of Mecca, and the second is the Grand Mufti of Medina. Unfortunately, my visit with the Grand Mufti was painful at best. To every question I asked, his answer was one of two. Jesus came to the Jews. Or, if it's in the Quran, it's true. But the core of his belief was that only those who spoke Arabic could really understand the Quran and that only a Muslim had the right to quote it. It is utterly amazing to me that Muslims believe that access to the Quran is restricted by both language and affirmation, and yet Islam is a religion for the world. All of his answers were ultimately swallowed up in the world of political theory and ethnic superiority. These realities are inescapable to the Muslim today. To believe in the superiority of the culture within which the last and the greatest prophet revealed the perfect book in a distinctive language is built into the fabric of the worldview of any Muslim. This is the world of pride and prejudice. This is what happens when we think we are the favored sons and daughters of a prejudicial God. So many world conflicts abound today over matters of race and ethnicity, each considering itself superior to the other. One can argue from the beginning to the end of each day 
about what it means to be a Christian or what it means to be a Muslim or a follower of any other religion, including atheism. The bottom line will always haunt what is the political and cultural vision of this religion. Thomas Sowell, senior research fellow at the Hoover Institute of Stanford University, has written a book called A Conflict of Visions. In his introduction, he writes, quote, Visions may be moral, political, economic, religious, or social. Where visions conflict irreconcilably, whole societies may be torn apart. Conflicts of interests dominate the short run, but conflicts of visions dominate history. An invitation to freedom and trust. As the son of David, Jesus never envisioned a political structure for his people with him as the leader. The politics of Jesus was spiritually foundational, not morally dictatorial. He desired to rule in the hearts of men and women with the imperative of love and truth, not with the sword and the imperatives of fear and legalism. The world of Islam, or any other worldview or religion that enjoins a political theory, rules with a rod of fear and threats. Call of Jesus is an invitation to freedom and trust. I am free only in as much as I can trust my fellow human being. If I cannot trust those around me, I am not free. We must know the one to whom we belong and who calls us all to the same purpose. Only when I am at peace with the son of David can I be at peace with myself, and only then will I be at peace with my fellow humans and truly free. Let me illustrate. Our family has always had a dog. I'm the kind of person who enjoys having a dog, provided the distance is always maintained between man and animal. All furniture and food prepared for the consumption of humans are off limits for the dog, as far as I'm concerned. But with the kids who treat dogs as immediate family, it's hard to win out. For many years, we had a beautiful border collie that we brought home from England. We named him G.K. in honor of one of my favorite authors, G.K. Chesterton, much to the dismay of the British Kennel Society, which did not think G.K. was a suitable name for a member of such a distinguished canine species. So they settled for Chester in their records, but we ignored that stricture. He was G.K. We were privileged to have him for 12 great years. He was obedient to the core, loyal to the end, and disciplined to the point of making humans look bad. In the last year of his life, he was diagnosed with cancer. One afternoon, I saw him lying in the entryway to our bedroom, belly breathing, and unable to respond when I spoke to him. I phoned my wife, Margie, and told her G.K. seemed to be in his last hours, if not minutes. She rushed home from our daughter's house, for G.K. was really Margie's dog. When he heard her car pulling into the driveway, he strained to turn his head. His neck craned towards the garage, and as the door opened, he realized it was her. I saw an amazing expression in his eyes of loyalty and love. He struggled to get up on all fours and somehow hobbled over to her and collapsed at her feet. Anyone who had seen that kind of love and devotion he displayed would have had to wipe away the tears. The Bible makes a remarkable comment about the allegiance of an animal. The ox knows his master, the donkey his owner's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Isaiah 1 3. What does it mean to be a person? Surely it must at least mean that even if an animal can recognize its master, we must also see ourselves in a relationship to the author of our lives, who gives us the distinctive of personhood that transcends all race and ethnic barriers. We relate, we love, we care, we belong. The rule of affection, trust, and love is something intuitively woven into our beings. That is why it is reprehensible for a parent to betray a child and why cruelty to the animal world is seen as inhuman, because as humans we are supposed to value the created order, and the weakest among us who cannot speak for themselves must be spoken for. The plea of Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, elicited the ultimate compliment when Jesus asked Bartimaeus what he wanted from him. To see, 
came the answer. In echoing this response, we break free from our ethnicity and our assumed privilege of race. The Gospel writer in Matthew 26 reminds the reader that David himself, in Psalm 110 and verse 1, referred to Jesus as his Lord when he said, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. End of quote. Here comes the contrariety. The Messiah is called the son of David, when, in effect, David's greatness lay in the fact that he recognized the lordship of the Messiah. It was not that Jesus was the son of David, but that David, by faith, was Jesus' son. The vision of God for humanity is that we might see his claim on us as an invitation to live and love, transcending all ethnic and cultural boundaries, not because Jesus is David's son, but because he is the instrument of power over all other power, of essential worth over political ideology, of human need over ethnic arrogance. He has eradicated every barrier of race and culture and position in life. David was a king, but in the eyes of God, he was a child of God. Son of man, we go beyond political and ethnic claims to Jesus' claim to full humanity. Of all the titles that Jesus could have selected, the one he used most of himself was the Son of Man. Eighty-two times in the New Testament, all of the occurrences, with one exception, are in the Gospels, and all but two are from the lips of Jesus himself. The one exception is when Stephen used it, moments before his martyrdom. I see heaven open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God, Acts 7, 56. The other exception to Jesus' usage of the term is when the crowd reacted to Jesus' prediction of his crucifixion by saying, We have heard from the law that the Christ will remain forever, so how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? John 12, 34. Clearly, this was a title Jesus considered to be very significant. Understanding this term then ought to be taken seriously and distinctively from the definition given by secular humanism of what it means to be human. In the previous section, we saw the person of Jesus, the son of David, transcending cultures and ethnic barriers to underscore our existence as children of God. In the title, Son of Man, we see both the glory and the shame of the universe and all the transcending uniqueness that underscores the essence of every human being cutting across gender. Conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of a woman, Jesus actually has no male ancestry, yet he is called the Son of Man. In Psalm 8.4, David asks, What is man that you are mindful of him, the Son of Man that you care for him? In Jesus' mission as the Son of Man, we also see the ultimate horror of who we can become when we throw away the mirror for our souls. I do not intend a theological study of this title here, so I shall resist digressing, as tempting as it might be. Suffice to say, there are many implications of its usage. Let me mention just three here. First, by the title, Son of Man, we are reminded of the significance of humanness by identifying himself with humanity, what dignity and nobility Jesus has given us. Second, Jesus identified himself with this term in the third person. Rather than saying, I, he referred to himself as the Son of Man. He's clearly making a distinctive identification here. The writers of the Bible often use a prophetic passage to give the background or context of a statement before applying it in the present or to the future. Peter did this on the day of Pentecost as recorded in the book of Acts. Amazed and perplexed by what they saw taking place, they asked one another, what does this mean? Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, Acts 2, 12, 14 and 16. Another example is Jesus' address at the synagogue in Nazareth. He did the expected when he accepted the scroll of the prophet Isaiah that was handed to him. Unrolling it, Luke says, He found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Luke 4.18, 1 
quoting Isaiah 61, 1. But then he did the unexpected. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, sat down and said, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, Luke 4, 21. He took what they knew and were expecting, calling to their memories the context, and announced its fulfillment in the present, in himself. Imagine the scene. This is once again a typically Eastern way of speaking of oneself in the third person. He identified himself as the fulfillment of the prophecy while retaining the distinction of the Eternal Son, now in incarnate and temporal form, by using the third person. Third, the term Son of Man in Ezekiel and Daniel was used in a particular sense. The following reference in Daniel is instructive. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. This is a key passage for understanding the expectations people had for the Son of Man, which are clearly messianic. But note something remarkable. In the period of history between the Testaments, writings about the Son of Man became politicized and power-driven. Instead of a focus on worship, it turned to judgment, domination, glory, ownership, control, everything we consider to be the trappings of absolute power. Some years ago, I was privileged to address the heads of state in a particular continent at their first annual prayer breakfast. I arrived, but unfortunately my suitcases didn't. After checking into the hotel and making contacts to try and get my luggage to this remote city before the breakfast the next morning, my bags finally arrived in my hotel room around 3 a.m. I was able to arrive at the venue a few hours later, suitably dressed, although not very calm in my spirit. Each president made his appearance amid great pomp and circumstance, a convoy of high-priced automobiles, black-suited security men wearing dark glasses and ladies bedecked in great finery befitting the power of their station, formed the entourage of each leader. As the breakfast began and one speaker after another welcomed the guests and spoke to their common issues, it became obvious that the continent was in serious trouble. Rife with life-threatening disease and, in most countries, poverty beyond description. I sat at the head table through all this, my head swirling with fatigue, emotion, and questions. Were we real or fake? Did we really care? Or was this politics as usual? After my talk, one president said to me, Our cumulative wisdom is unable to meet the daunting challenges of our time no more sobering assessment could have been made. That night, my son, a colleague, and I went out for dinner, and we were served by a pleasant young waiter named Ernest. He was very cordial, and we had a good conversation with him. As we were about to leave, he said, Sirs, if you ever come back to my country, would you please bring me a pair of shoes? He lifted his foot to show us that the soles of his shoes were worn through. He said he had to walk for over an hour to work each day, and his shoes were constantly wearing out because they were of such poor quality. I asked him what his size was and suggested I could mail him a pair, but he quickly pointed out that they would never make it past the post office. So all we could do was to take his contact information and promise to bring him some shoes if we were ever to come back. It was dark by now, and as we walked back to the hotel, my son Nathan said, Dad, Ernest's shoe size is the same as mine. I have a brand new pair of Doc Martens in my room. He just bought them in England a few weeks previous. I said, what do you want to do? He said, I think we'll take them back to the restaurant. So we wrapped them up, walked back the way we had come. When we entered the restaurant, we asked for Ernest and handed him the package. Curious, he opened it and looked inside as the other waiters crowded around to see what he had. With great excitement, he pulled out the shoes tried them on, they were a perfect fit. Our eyes filled with tears as the other waiters high-fived him. Our only regret is that we didn't have a pair to give each of them. The contrast between our experience the morning and this experience at night was literally night and day. 
In the bright setting of Pau, we had sensed darkness, and in this dark setting of simplicity, we'd been touched by the light. Now, this story has everything to do with the Son of Man. We are told that the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Luke 19, verse 10. Who is Jesus? He has identified himself with every human being regardless of culture, color, or belief. He is on the face of every human being. Jacob betrayed his brother Esau and stole his blessing from their blind father Isaac in Genesis 27. When the moment of reckoning came more than 20 years later and Jacob came face to face with his brother, he begged for Esau's favor and said, To see your face is like seeing the face of God. Genesis 33 verse 10 The Son of Man crosses barriers and cultures because we are all made in God's image. But the Son of Man came to suffer and to be crucified. Mark and Luke both quote Jesus as saying that it was for this reason that he came to earth as a man, Mark 8.31 and Luke 9.22. Not only did he love every human being, especially the downtrodden, the core of his message is that he came to embody the rejection and suffering of every person who has ever lived. Most of the times that Jesus used this title were in the context of his suffering and crucifixion. When Jesus told Peter that he would have to suffer and die, Peter thundered back that it could not possibly be so. Matthew 16, 23. Peter could not imagine such a scenario taking place because his expectations were only that the Son of Man would come as a conqueror, a ruler, the personification of unrelenting power. Now he was being asked to accept the Son of Man as a suffering servant and a crucified Messiah, that the Messiah would suffer at the hands of his own creation and be mocked for his powerlessness was unthinkable. Our experience of power is that it is used to subdue its opponents with greater strength and authority than they have. But Jesus demonstrated that true power means restraint and mercy. He redefined power. And suffering became something that was not only the lot of the weak, but the personal choice of the Almighty. It is this picture of Jesus that the world can never seem to grasp. We think that the rhetoric of politicians will solve all of our problems. A new face, a new voice, a new eloquence, Change becomes the mantra, the entourage follows the voice, and hopes become rife once again. How wrong and simplistic we have become. True leadership only comes with an understanding of the Son of Man and His mission and vision, because in our quest to understand Him, He reveals to us the inner workings of our own hearts. He endured suffering Himself to underscore our inner tragedy. We need not just political change. We need a change of our hearts, and only the Son of Man, who identified himself with us and personified both our glory and our shame, can accomplish that. Son of God, no title is more recognized as properly belonging to Jesus than the Son of God. Although it is mystifying, it also reveals the very being of God. For God, who is one in essence, reveals himself by this title as a being in relationship, a trinity. This revelation of God as a being in relationship has led to a misunderstanding of God and to great misrepresentation. Any fisherman knows that one and three are not the same. Any thinking person knows that to talk of three persons in one essence defies any analogy except to a psychologically deranged person. It is here that I think the Christian message has the only answer to the greatest question in philosophy, a question that has been asked since the time of the early Greeks. How does one find unity in diversity? Academics and cultures have both pursued an answer, but with the concept of three in one within the very person of God, we find that three individual wills aligned in one essence is precisely how God has disclosed himself, unity, in diversity. And as we have been created in God's image, 
It is precisely this relationship within the Godhead that provides the possibility of relationship among us. No illustration will ever fully capture this. Many have been tried and have fallen short. But let me make one more attempt. The Bible describes marriage as the sacred coming together of a man and woman in a consummate and exclusive relationship, and they will become one flesh, Genesis 2.24. When the consummate sexual act is completed and the woman is impregnated, at that moment of conception, whether she realizes it or not, there are actually three persons within one being. The woman, the seed of her husband, and between them, the third person, the child. The woman is no longer responsible only for herself, for she is carrying her husband's distinctive DNA. That, joined with her DNA, will engender the distinctive third person with his or her own DNA. In a strange and mystical but factual way, there are three in one. We claim to understand this process of conception, but all we do is create constructs of self-referencing meaning and think we have solved the puzzle. We may as well describe why a plane flies while ignoring the aircraft's designer and how he met the terms of the laws of aerodynamics. I ask a very simple question. If, in our finitude, we can understand this concept of three-in-one in procreation, is it really impossible for the Creator, who is infinite, to be three in one sense and one in another sense? Every hunger of the human heart, whether for love, for an explanation to human suffering, or for a way to understand death, has at its root the assumption that people and their relationships have intrinsic value. By calling himself the Son of God, Jesus demonstrates that God is a relational being whose plan is to conform us as individuals to the image of his Son, Romans 8.29, and as a fellowship of believers to the relationship between the Son and the Father, that they may be one as we are one, John 17, 11, Jesus' prayer to the Father before his arrest and crucifixion. Savior. Among the numerous other titles Jesus carries is Savior, the one who saves. Once again, every expectation within the historical context of Jesus' coming was for one who would save his people as a nation, a cultural community, and a favored people, and deliver them from the oppression of Rome. Rome was the enemy. Rome had plundered them. Rome needed to be subdued. Isn't that the way it always is? It is always someone else's fault. It is always someone else who is the problem. In his existentialist play, No Exit, Jean-Paul Sartre described hell as, quote, other people. I'm all right. You are the problem. Do you know the story of the man who was stranded on an island for a long time? When he was finally rescued, he was asked to explain the three structures on the island with him. One is my home, he said, and one is my church, and the other one is the church I used to go to. <laughs> Jesus said that the problem is not everyone else. The problem is within each of us. Attempting to satisfy the passions that rage inside us and the longings that motivate us, we invent spirituality, lean on political solutions, create new villains, turn our backs on Jesus, and blame a thousand tyrannies, but we never come to terms with the source of the problem deep within the heart and inclination of every human being. No matter our accomplishments or successes, our failures or shortcomings, the greatest struggle we face is within ourselves. Some years ago, Canadian author Douglas Copeland wrote a book titled Life After God in which he reflects on the experiences of his own generation, a generation in which the majority have given up on God and pursued life according to their own goals and values apart from God, with varying degrees of success. But when he ends the book, he catches his readers completely off guard. Now, here is my secret. I tell it to you with an openness of heart that I doubt I shall ever achieve again. So I pray that you're in a quiet room as you hear these words. My secret 
is that I need God, that I'm sick and I can no longer make it alone. I need God to help me give because I no longer seem capable of giving, to help me be kind as I no longer seem capable of kindness, to help me love as I seem beyond being able to love. I am sick. That is the malady. And Jesus came as the answer to the problem. He is the physician of the soul. In a recent tragedy of enormous proportions, India's fifth largest high tech company was dealt a blow off foundation shaking news. The CEO and founder disclosed that the company books had been doctored for years to misrepresent the true picture. The billions the company claimed in profit were simply not there. The founder had engaged in a monumental game of deceit. And in his letter of confession and resignation, he wrote, quote, I felt like I was riding a tiger, not knowing how to get off without being eaten. His company is called Satyam, which ironically means truth. On November 26, 2008, a gang of Islamic terrorists stormed the historic Taj Mahal Palace Hotel in Mumbai. After the carnage that took over 200 innocent lives ended, one of the guests who had been at the hotel for dinner that night was interviewed by the media, an Indian-born English actor. He described how he and his friends were eating dinner when they heard gunshots. Someone grabbed him and pulled him under the table. The assassins came striding through the restaurant, shooting at will until everyone, so they thought, had been killed. This man, however, found himself miraculously alive. When the interviewer asked him how it was that everyone at his table and in the room was dead, and yet he was alive, his answer was sobering. I suppose it's because I was covered in someone else's blood, and they took me for dead. This is a perfect metaphor of God's gift through Jesus to each one of us, because he paid the penalty for our sin, because we are covered in the blood of his sacrifice, we may have eternal life. The Jesus of history is the Jesus who meets all of humanity in the innermost regions of our hearts, hungers, and in our minds, needs. He is the one who transcends cultures, boundaries, and circumstances. He is the one who, by his identification with us, has given us intrinsic value. He is the physician of our souls. He is the one who gives us eternal life through his own death and resurrection. He transcends all that divides us from ourselves, from each other, and from God, both the significant things and the insignificant things, and gives us the life for which he created us, to recognize God's presence, his power, and his design in our lives, is to understand that Jesus is who he says he is, to believe that true life can only be found in him. Jesus said to Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. John 20, verse 29. John writes, These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Verse 31. Who is Jesus? He's the Son of David, the Son of Man, the Son of God, and the Savior not to defeat Rome, not to take care of the other guy, not to abolish the other political party. He is the Savior, the only one who can deliver us from the tigers within our own deceitful hearts. This is Jesus. Knowing who he is makes the journey to a strong faith rational, even though the way is punctuated with times of struggle. In our ethnic, human, and relational conflicts, we can see what happens when we displace the one who transcends all these issues and in breaking our relationship with him, we break it with each other and ultimately with ourselves. This rupture of serious ramifications often leaves us saying that our faith has failed us rather than pausing to see what we have done to the content and object of our faith, we lay blame at the doorstep of God.